The motivation is incredible, incredibly important part of our practice. Motivation we begin at the beginning of any activity. This is directing our mind and our awareness in a most positive direction. At the end is dedicating whatever positive energy we've created and dedicating and motivating for our enlightenment quickly so we can benefit all living beings. As a Buddha, we're unlimited in doing that, in benefiting all living beings. So take a moment to consider why you came here right now, why you're showing up online, and if it's possible to expand beyond your own interests, think about getting a little information about your dying process, about the nature of change in our lives. Can we use that to further our path to enlightenment quickly? Because so many beings need our help right now. So many beings need our help right now. And so that we may help them, the best way to do it is as a Buddha, according to this tradition. As a Buddha, as a fully awakened being, we're unlimited in how we can help them. So if you like that idea, feel free to include that in your motivation. Take a moment to set that intention for our time together and all the activities of the rest of your day. So bring your awareness now to a normal, natural breath. Simply watching the air come in the nostrils, releasing it. It's very common for the mind to wander off the breath. You just watch your mind and observe gently. And if you're off the breath, you just bring your mind back to the breath. No judgment. You try your best. So I'd like you to reflect right now on the changes you can notice happening in your body right now. For instance, you might swallow. Reflect on every time you breathe, different molecules of air are coming in. Different amounts of air are coming in and going out. And just note the changes in your body that you can observe right now, the blatant, obvious changes 
going on in your body right now. Sorry, I wonder if you could come and sit with us. We're doing meditation now. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like you to reflect right now on the changes you may not note that are happening in your body right now. Heart is beating. You may not even be aware of that. Lungs are doing their process. Digestive activity. Cells are replicating, passing away. Just get an idea and reflect on all the changes happening in your body right now that are not so obvious. So just get a sense of that changing nature of your body. Is there anything in your body that's not changing right now? What about your mind? Just take a look at your mind for a moment. Notice the thoughts, feelings, (coughs) memories, ideas passing through. Look at the changing nature of your mind. And just get this sense of body and mind in this ever-constant flowing, ever-constant movement and change. It's its nature. This is the nature of reality. 
everything changes. Look at your external reality right now. So first we're in this room, but the air is changing all the time. Molecules moving around, even in some of the more solid things in this room, like the carpet, the flooring, the walls, just molecules moving more slowly. And imagine beyond this room in the outside space, cars moving by, plants growing, insects moving around, people walking by. Just get a sense of the changing nature of life, of reality. So please relax, and slowly when you're ready, please open your eyes. I know we don't have a lot of time, today. This meditation on impermanence is really helpful, something you can do regularly because we resist change. How many of you are good with change? Pretty good. Great. That's two hands that went up. Okay. I don't know about you online, but um, we struggle and we suffer because we resist change. This is, this is nature. This is natural. This meditation helps to remind myself everything's changing. So death becomes kind of what they say traditionally, a changing of clothes. A changing of clothes. Tibetan Buddhism believes in reincarnation. As a result, we have been through this many, many, many times. I'm in, in a little bit jokingly, we have died many times according to Tibetan Buddhism, and we've survived it. Okay? <laughs> right? You know, in a sense, there really are no dead people. You're in one life. There's a different way of thinking. And, and through this way of thinking, you become a little bit more spacious and peaceful with the idea of death. You're in this life according to Tibetan Buddhism. Then you're in an in-between phase when you're not in this life anymore. And then after that phase, you're in another life. Okay. That's, that's the reality in Tibetan Buddhism. So there really are no dead people. Okay. Now, I know we have been through, many of us, parents have died, friends have died, partners have died. God forbid children have died. You, you know, it's one of the worst deaths to go through. Okay. But what happens is, Uh, We see suddenly the person that was full of life, that we love, that we're attached to, that did all these things, suddenly there's a lifeless body, okay? It's a coding. It's simply a coding. But we are so attached to this coding. We're so attached to this cover, this costume we put on, okay? And what happens is we put on this costume based on the activities that we do with our body, speech, and mind every moment creates this, what my life will be like, what I look like, okay, what nationality I'll have, what vocation I'll have, whether I'm rich or poor, fat or thin, happy or not happy, is all based on 
the activities I'm doing with my body, speech, and mind every moment. So what we want to do is wake up those activities and merge them with more virtuous habits so that the choices I'm making, the activities I'm engaged with are all about helping people, helping beings as much as I can possibly do. We're limited as humans, not a Buddha, means I'm limited, and it also means I make mistakes. Human nature is flawed, so I'm not saying you're bad. I'm just waking up to reality and saying, sometimes I'm limited. Yeah. Some, somebody comes to you, a friend comes to you needing help, right? And what you do is you advise based on what you know, okay? But we're limited. We don't, and, and sometimes a friend comes to you, right? And you don't know what to say, right? But you, you say what you know from your own wisdom that you develop, some wisdom, some compassion. Imagine being a Buddha, then you know. You know exactly how to be any moment for the greatest benefit. So that's where we're headed in Tibetan Buddhism. That's where we're headed. And along the way, we try our best. We try our best, okay? So we wanna think about, to get ready for death, what habits I'm making every moment. And one of the things that's going on, I just did a, fortunately did a retreat for four months up in the mountains in Nepal. And um, it was very helpful to kind of hitting a reset button, you know. And what I, what I felt like, um, some of my habits maybe not as good or not, you know, wanting to have a little bit more expansiveness. And I tend to do also, is that okay? Can you hear? No? Okay. Thank you. We'll try that. Thank you. No, no, it's okay. Thank you. So what we want to do is um, I do consults with people and coaching. And the biggest thing I get from people in all countries, in all countries, is their addiction right now. I don't know if this relates to you. Good. Okay. Super. Everybody can hear. Their addiction to their technology. Am I speaking to anybody in here? No? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. You know this box? Okay. So be very cautious. Be very careful what you're doing with your technology. There's great benefits with technology. Look, look at all the people online right now. We can do this. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. But there's addiction with technology. Okay, so you want to get ready for death. You've got to be very cautious and skillful and wise. You all have, you're developing your own wisdom to figure out what you want to do on those devices. Your phone, your tablet, your computer. Okay, I just talked to a, a nun friend of mine, nun, longer than me. She's a smart woman, right? She runs one of our centers, okay? And she's living in the United States. So somehow we just quickly had a, a quick chat and she said to me, she's not sleeping well. And I said, what, what's happening? You know, anxiety over the election coming up in the United States. So the thing is, these are things that happen. There's wars on the planet right now. So I could kind of say, well, sorry, I have anxiety. I can't teach it to Shida Delhi because I'm having anxiety. It doesn't really help people. So if you keep the bigger motivation in play is I'm here, I, I really want to move on this path. You know, sometimes the path, it struggles. I struggle too, I'm a nun, I'm not perfect. Okay, but I'm gonna to try to move on this path as much as I can, All right? Why? Because I want to help everybody perfectly. So if I, if I wake up and have that motivation every day and I have the habit of that motivation, okay, that informs everything and there's joy in my heart even with a war in Ukraine, even with the mess in the Middle East right now. And nobody wants to talk about Africa and Sudan, what's going on there. I just read some article, you know, people go, oh, Africa, Sudan, we, we hear about it, right? But then I read this article, tactics, war tactics in Sudan. So what they do is, I just came from Laudo, uh, Solo Kumbu, Nepal, way up in the mountains in the Mount Everest region. I've done a lot of retreats up there, it's very remote. Because it's remote, 
people grow their own food. They have to. The market's too far away. So they have a small farm there. And I watched all the crops going in and the, you know, and I was eating the food they were growing. Greenhouses and outside the greenhouses. You know, so I'm watching this process. So Sudan, they have the same process. You need to grow your own food in certain areas. So what they do in the war there is people are shooting the people that go in to, to water their crops. So they're starving them. It's a tactical, but we don't hear about that because they're black. They're dark skin. That those people don't matter as much. On the, you know, so, so this is going on. This is samsara. And that's a Sanskrit word to turn, to cycle. So, and we're cycling through suffering. That's all that means. So as long as you have an ordinary mind like me, okay, you're going to live in samsara and you're going to experience war and poverty and jealousy and fear and depression and anxiety. But if you let it topple you, if you let it knock you off balance, I can't really help anybody. So I want to keep that buoyant cushion, what I'm going to call bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, Sanskrit term, many of you have heard of it, the enlightened attitude. The enlightened attitude. Okay, and what that's about is I want to be a Buddha so I can benefit all living beings. Okay? And that's my cushion that I ride on, and I get on that cushion every morning, and, it, and it's like a little air cushion. So I can kind of zip around with all the little pebbles under me and boulders and all those little stumbling blocks, and it feels comfortable for me. Okay, war isn't comfortable for me. That's not comfortable, but I, I want to like be able to see people and go, what do you, hey, you're struggling, what's going on? Can I help you? Can, that, that's what we want to do to get ready for death. It's the best thing we can do to get ready for death. Sorry, can we turn that off? Is, I'm not sure what's going on back there. Can we do that later? Is there? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we're just having the class, and we can have tea later if you'd like. Yeah. So, so do you understand what I mean? This is the preparation we have to do, and and you can't wait any longer. It's a mess, this planet. Okay, but I don't have to get buried in the mess. I feel good. I feel jo joyful most days. Okay, to help people. You know, I'm aware of what's going on. You know, and then you do what you can for these things. If certain, you know, there's certain wars going on. So I was just up, up on the mountain. The village across from us, a two-hour walk away, got flooded, August 16th. Tame, where Lama Zobrimshu was born, was flooded, okay? So people go, oh, my God, a flood of... Well, figure out what you can do. You can give money. We went over. We walked over there a couple weeks ago. Lend support. We made donations. You lend support. I mean, you do what you can do. You can't fix everything. The only thing you can fix, what's the only thing you can fix? There is one thing you can fix. Your mind. Your mind. Okay. You can't fix your mother, by the way. You can't fix your partner or your kid. Sorry. Okay. You can fix your mind. So I'm not here to judge your mind and this one. And is I got to be honest with myself, what's going on in my mind, and create healthy patterns. So you wake up in the morning, okay? How many people get out of bed right away? Now, most people don't. See, there's like two, three hands here. Most people do not. You, you lie there a little bit. Maybe the alarm went off, okay? Maybe you just woke up naturally. doesn't matter. You start your motivation right there. My practice starts right there in bed, okay? First couple of minutes, first couple of minutes. I'm, I'm just asking to give me five minutes, okay? Five minutes to make a difference. First two minutes a day is preparation for death, okay? Because we don't have time to go into all the... You want a, you want a death thing? Come up to Dharamsala at the end of November. Nine-day death retreat. You want all the info about death and all the meditations? Come up and sit with me. That's what we're going to do. It starts around November 20th, okay? It's really valuable. I've done... I do many times. Really, really helpful. First two minutes of the day, you wake up. How do you wake up? I'm curious. What are your waking thoughts? You just wake up, and what do you think when you wake up? What's going on? You reach for your phone? Remember my dreams. Remember your dreams, okay. In the back. Switch on the water thing. You switch on the water thing? Oh, yeah. 
You look at your dogs, yeah. Okay. Great. And 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 so and people what how else do people wake up? I try to uh, smile and think. Very nice, yeah. I try to go for jogging. And you try to go jogging. So what I'm trying to get you to do is what are the actual thoughts that are going on? Like you look at your dogs, you wake up and you smile, you, you want to go jogging, but those initial thoughts you wake up, some people wake up with their lists, what they have to do that day. Some people wake up with a groan. Anybody like that? Like, oh, another day. Some people wake up like that. You know, it's, if you have a big task ahead of you, a horrible meeting, they think, you know, people wake up, oh, okay. But you have a precious human rebirth, by the way. Okay, this is the beginning of our philosophy. You have a precious human rebirth. What that means is you're a human being who met the Dharma. You have a way out of this mess. A lot of the world doesn't right now. They don't know. They don't know what to do, right? But you met the Dharma. You, you have a jewel. You found a jewel. Our, our practice is to polish that jewel till it's crystal clear, till you're a Buddha, okay? So what if you spend the first two minutes even with these thoughts, dreams, whatever you're doing, is the first two minutes, I wake up and I have this, like, first of all, you wake up and you realize, but, but see, we skip this part, the body and mind's functioning, right? Do you ever, you know, there's going to be one day you won't be able to get out of bed. But just think about people that can't get out of bed or the mentally ill that aren't thinking properly, okay? But you wake up and it system's working. That's pretty cool. Okay, so do you ever have a little like succulence of that? Like, wow, two minutes. Okay, if you want to go through some real meditations on precious human rebirth, there's 18 situations, according to our tradition, that make up a precious human rebirth. Learn what those are and focus. Here's, I'll give you one. We're free from, there's eight freedoms, 10 richnesses. One of the things we're free from is being an animal. Okay. So if you wake up with dogs around you, I happen to like animals a lot. I've, I've had many animals, okay? But I don't see any animals in here right now studying Dharma. They're limited. And they might be very smart, but they're still limited, okay? So I just think, well, I'm free from being an animal. Think about an animal. Think about your dog. Think about what they eat. Do you want to eat that food? No. Think about the limitations of their freedom. They go outside when you decide to take them outside. They, they have fears. I don't know if your dogs on Diwali freaked out because of all the explosions, all the fireworks. Most dogs hate fireworks. So they don't understand. You know, we're just like, it's just fireworks and the dog's under the bed. Okay? This is the limitation of the animal realm. So a minute, you want to just put your mind in the animal's mind. They're terrified. Okay. I just spent outside, I had a little, um, very primitive at Laudo, I had a little sink out, actually it was very fancy for me, but I had a little sink outside, and there were many birds that would come while I'd be brushing my teeth, washing my face, birds. So I had crackers for them every morning, I put some crackers out, I found out the name is the variegated laughing thrush. I was feeding a whole family of them, right? And they all had their own little personalities, but do you ever watch the way birds eat? And certain animals in the wild, terrified. Something else is going to swoop down, like that. So you have to be in that mind. We're free from being an animal. So have two minutes of succulence, precious human rebirth. Drink it in. Breathe in. Oh, my God. Amazing. Amazing. Breathe it out. It's incredible. Let it soak through all the pores of your skin, all your cells. Amazing way to wake up. Next two minutes, okay? This is a little bit sobering. This situation I created, which is fantastic, okay? It is ending soon. Sorry to inform you, everyone in this room. It is coming to an end, definitely. And it's going to be soon, okay? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're 40, it's still soon. 40, another, you get another 40 years, that's like this. And it gets, it feels quicker as you get older, right? <laughs> it really goes quicker as we get older feels that way, okay? So two minutes I have a reflection on death. Okay. Now, the way I do the reflection, and you can work your way up to it, some people will say, 
well, I, this could be my last day. Some people, you don't know, they woke up in the morning, they didn't think it would be their last day, it was. Something happened, okay? This could be my last, but I, I, I go through, this is my last day. This is it, six o'clock tonight, I'm gone, okay? So then people say to me, don't say that, you'll create your death. I've been doing this for years, I'm still here, okay? So have some reflection, you know, this, how do I want to be on my last day? How do I want to be? This could be it. How do I want to be? It's not a matter of, well, I'm not going to work. It's my last day. No, you, you participate in your activities. How do you want to be if it was your last day? Most people want to be happy, peaceful, spacious. Most people want to be good on their last day. They want to be kind to people, and they want people to be kind back. Okay, so have this two-minute reflection. This could be my last day. How do I want to be? That's four minutes. Fifth minute, set your motivation. Okay, but I get another day. I get today. How do I want to be today? I want to be as kind, spacious as possible. Put it into your own words. And I'd like to direct all of the activities that I do with my body, speech, and mind towards something positive that is going to get me enlightened quickly. It's going to get me to Buddhahood quickly. Why? So I can benefit all living beings, all living beings. And with that motivation, I get out of bed. With that motivation, I brush my teeth, wash, get dressed, have my coffee, right? And you, and you want to try to move that motivation through your day. You will forget the motivation throughout the day. Leave yourself little notes. Leave yourself a reminder on the phone that you check what's my motivation and just rekindle to start a habit in your mind of trying to create that mindset for yourself with whatever activity you're doing as much as you can. Does that make sense? Are we communicating? Okay. So you try. For me, that's one of the biggest preparations for death. How I wake up, you know, motivations. You can have a motivation for going to sleep. Motivation for going to sleep. We have to sleep for our health. So I want to recharge. I want to get a good night's sleep. I'd like to sleep well. Maybe I want to remember certain dreams. That's fine. But can I sleep well to have good energy tomorrow, to practice Dharma, to be a kind person, good-hearted, to continue that path to enlightenment, why? So I can benefit all living beings again. And it's with that intention, I'll practice the yoga of going to sleep. Or it could be the yoga of eating lunch. Or the yoga of visiting my parents. The yoga of driving my car or taking the subway. Or do you know what I'm saying? Is all these little exercises to incorporate that in the mind. Okay, so let me give you a little longer. The easiest death meditation is the waking up one. You know, I'm going to die today. Okay, that's the easy one. There's a nine-point death meditation that's very helpful. We go into this in the retreat in depth. Okay, nine different points under three headings. Okay, and each of those points lead you to different resolutions. Three resolutions, okay, that really help deepen your understanding to maximize this life right now. So we think of death as morbid. People, my mother used to say, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Because a lot of our cultures push it away. But then you're dying. Or then you're with somebody who's dying. And then they want to talk about it, and we're uncomfortable. So a lot of our practice, a lot of spiritual practice, is getting more comfortable with the uncomfortable like that. So the nine point, let me go through the nine point death meditation. Three main headings, okay? Under each heading are three reasonings that convince you, okay, of that heading that deepen your experience, right? And then they lead to three resolutions. And then you start making a little bit more meaning in your life, but you, each one is designed for you to meditate on it over time. Meditations are designed analytical 
meditations. So we have a meditation where we're placing our mind on an object. Mostly we think of that as meditation. I'm focusing on something profoundly to drive one point. But a second meditation we do is analytical. We're analyzing something. Okay? And we'll go through parts of the philosophy analyzing, meaning we're coming from every angle. Okay, so the nine-point death meditation is designed like that. So let me give you the three headings. And then what you do is, and what we'll do in the retreat is, some of these meditations we do over and over and over again. And what it does is analytical meditations work and are designed to move an intellectual understanding here. I think everyone in this room knows you're going to die, but you don't have it here. Okay? So an intellectual meditation, analytical meditation, moves it to where you have an experiential realization. I know I'm going to die. And then you start living differently. right? And start seeping into different things in, in your life. But it's a gradual process. This isn't usually some rash thing and then you say to your family, I can't talk to you anymore. I can only talk about Dharma. No, you, let, let's make it gentle. Let's make it it's a gradual approach. So here are the three headings. Number one, everybody dies. Death is certain. Death is certain. It's definitely coming. I think we understand that. Okay. Number two, the time of death is uncertain. And I will make time for questions and answers as well. Okay. Uh, the time of death is uncertain. Harder point to realize. Number three, third main heading, the only thing that really benefits you at the death time is your spiritual practice, your spiritual practice. Let's look at number one, death is certain. Three points under this, three reasonings. Number one, everybody dies. Everybody dies. So when you're meditating, and this would be on the side, I'd have one of our basic philosophy books of the Lam Rim. I'd go through the parts on death, and there's different passages. And some will speak to me more, and some will, will and I'll go, well, that, that's a good reason, part of the reasonings. So when you think everybody dies, in the meditation, and, and in the retreat, I lead guided meditations, think of who's the oldest person you know? Who's the old, old, oldest person you've ever seen and witnessed? I mean, beyond 100, it's very rare, right? It's very rare, okay? So then I also think of, some of the most brilliant people on the planet have died. They didn't figure out a way out of it. Right? Some of the richest people on the planet couldn't bribe their way out of death. Right? Haven't fixed that. Scientists, creative artists didn't figure out a way to get out of death. They died. So I kind of go through all these famous people I can think of. I think of people that I know in my own life that died. You know, who escaped it? You know, and over and over, you want to keep your mind single pointedly. This is how we combine analytical meditation with single point of concentration, shine, calm abiding. Okay. So I'm going to go over and over and think of like Einstein died and some incredible leaders. Gandhi died. He was amazing. Jesus Christ died, right? The Buddha died. Well, if the Buddha didn't sort it, I'm, I'm, a, I'm immune from this situation. All these incredible beings, people walked on the moon, they died, couldn't sort it. People created cures for cancer and transplanted hearts and they died. Amazing. So you want to slowly soak your mind in that thinking and then sometimes you come to a little bit here, I'm going to die. Then you want to take your shine, your kama body, that single pointed laser and apply it to that to deepen that experience then it fades i'm going to go back and analyze again think of all these people that died this aunt and that grandmother and everybody was there anybody that didn't die that's older you know think of all these people that's reasoning number one okay. reasoning number two under death is certain is um we spend um uh, it's every moment we're closer to death. Every moment we're closer to death. I think of my birth. I got dropped out of an airplane without a parachute. 
here we are falling through our lives. Okay, I'm definitely going to hit the ground. The ground is there and I'm going to die. But right now there's all these things streaming by me, my life and this partner and that job and this university and, you know, I went to that country and this streaming by. That's every moment. So you can do a little exercise with yourself through the, every, every day. You're in your kitchen, in your house. You're just walking to the refrigerator, right? You're, you're walking through your house. I'm another step closer to death. Another step closer to death. Just every step. You know, I'm another subway ride to work closer to death. We're right now, what's today's day, the day, Saturday? Saturday. Saturday. We're another Saturday, by the way, closer to death. We're another November closer. We're another Diwali closer to death. Right. But, I mean, this is a way to realize, like, it's... The older you get, the faster it ticks. That's how it feels. The older you get, like that. And it's, it's ticking. It's going. So you can play a little bit with that one. Every moment we're closer. Number third reasoning under death is certain. We don't have enough time to practice Dharma. We're not, we really don't have, in a 75 year lifespan, let's say, average 75 years, let's say you get 75 years. How much formal time would you say you're practicing something spiritual? That you're directing your life to becoming a Buddha? What would you say on an average? Anybody? A few minutes every day. A few minutes every day. What would that add up to, would you say? I don't know. It's a mathematical part, but when I say a few minutes every day, it doesn't mean that I meditate. It means basically when I go for my morning walks. All my evening rounds in the nature, I look at the life around me, the birds chirping, or the trees, then it's still is a meditation. Uh huh, sure, that's very nice. But if you say a few minutes a day, we've got 24 hours in a day, it's not a lot of time, is it? Yeah, but when you end up in 75 years, would you say that it's a lot of time? No, no. <laughs> not, time, it's not that. Okay. That's okay, that's okay. I mean, that's fine. But basically, they say you get a really formal five years. So it's not a lot of imprints, is it? To, for me to go through the death process and be aware and, be, and use that time. It's not a lot of... Five years is not a long time to make those deep imprints. Okay? But again, we try our best. You have to start where you are. You start where you are. But think about if you can ramp up a little bit. If you can add a little bit, you know, and it takes effort because we're very attached to all of our lives and activities, right? Like for me to get this four months, I just did and retreat and I've done it before. I, I had to start planning a year before and I started telling people, oh, well, next summer I'm, I'm offline. Like if you want me to teach next year, you need to get me before July, really like early June. And then I'm not available to November. So people were kind of, because they just said, oh, they'll send an email. And I had some people that sent an email in August. And I'm like, I, I wasn't online. So they didn't, they, they, get a, they get a vacation message, contact me in November. So it's like you really have to kind of plan and you have to insist. It's like a mini death when you go into retreat. You have to really say to everybody, bye. I'm, I'm over and out right now. And things happen. People die when you're in retreat. And unfortunately, nobody too close, but I, people that died, and when I came out, I got these messages, and I just add them to my prayer list, dedication, you know, an ad with the different dates to do these certain practices. But it's like that, but you have to just make decisions. Like, for me, it was really valuable to do that so I can renew to have more energy to teach and more from experience rather than blah, blah, intellectual knowledge. You know, you need some of that retreat time. So, but you make it... Um, possible for your life. Like whether it's a weekend retreat, you decide to say, let me try a weekend, see what that's like. And let me learn first in a group retreat, what I'm supposed to do. Let me get some instruction. And that's how I build it from there slowly so that I could later, some years later, say I could go away for four months and do, you know, and you want to find a, a conducive retreat place, things like that. I, I've also done retreat in the house where I'm based. At times, if there's no, you know, during COVID, 
we couldn't go anywhere. So I was like, well, maybe I can, you know, and you can do it with partners in your house and you just set limits where you're maybe part of the time I'm in the session. And then if you decide you come out and you talk to people and have a meal, that's okay. You know, as long as it's not too disturbing for the mind, there's many ways to set up retreat to just have a little bit more meditation every day, a little bit. Can I balance my mind more? That's a preparation for death. Can I keep my mind balanced? Like my friend called me today, the election. She's so again, like you want to keep the mind balanced. I purposely went into retreat this year to get away from the U S election. Cause that that's in the U S that's all, you know, I didn't want to hear the blah, blah. And my mind's more peaceful and balanced because of it. It's like, I know that's happening could be disastrous, but you know, well, I'm doing the best I can do. I can't control politics. I, you know, things like that. I think that's running away from reality. I mean, you have to face whatever is happening. So whatever is the outcome of elections, um, you have to face it. Um, by just going away, um, you're kind of running away from uh, facing the reality and um, accepting it. Well... <laughs> Partly, I'd say I felt that was the best thing I could do to do my prayers and to do the practice I was doing. I actually voted as well. So I did kind of everything that I could do. You know, I wasn't online like I was for the last election when I was actually making calls to people because I wasn't in the States to do it. But I actually felt based on that time, this was the best thing I could do this time. So again, each person's individual of what you feel that you can do. And the, and the thing is, I go back and I will be back on the States in January and I'm there for a few months because of the coaching and consult business that I do on the side. It's not really business, but it's what I try to help people is a number of people email and call me to have these meetings from all over the world. And people are really disturbed right now with anxiety, depression, things like that. So I wanted to have more available to them. And I felt like the retreat would give me that balance like that. So I think sometimes we have to, you know, renew ourselves. Sometimes it's better to be in the world. Sometimes you retreat a little bit. And I have the fortune being a nun where retreats, you know, definitely a big part of my life that I find the um, strides you can make on your spiritual path, but it's very individual like that. So those are the three reasonings. First thing, death is certain, and they lead you to a resolution and the resolution is, I have to practice. I have to practice Dharma. Like, this is the jewel. This is what I want to go for. Here's the second main heading. The time of death is uncertain. Okay? Time of death is uncertain. This is a harder one to realize. And the reason is, we, we even language it. We think we're going to die at 85 years old, peaceful in our sleep. How many people die like that? Not a lot. Some do, but not a lot that I know. Okay, so reasoning number one, we live in a world system with an unfixed lifespan. We know that. People die at all ages. So you, in the meditation, you want to have some review. All the different ages, people I know have died. You know, and there were people I knew that were so sick, we thought they were going to die, but the younger granddaughter died first, who was healthy. I mean, that happens all the time. You don't think this person, somebody was in an accident, natural disasters. The latest flood is in Spain. There were floods since July all over the world. Like where I used to live in Vermont was flooded in July. In August, the village across from us was flooded. Late September, we had an issue with rain in Nepal. 200 people died, just like they died in Spain now. Same thing happened. Then there was Germany. There were floods in the summer. People died. Like that. So you, don't, you didn't expect that when you woke up in the morning and then suddenly some landslide of mud and water comes down on your house. Like that. Happens all the time. There's also viruses, bacteria now. The planet's heating up. So these things are getting going. COVID. How many people died in COVID? We didn't expect that. We didn't expect that. People that were healthy died from COVID. You just don't know. One, my cousin years ago went in the hospital. He was relatively healthy. He went in the hospital for a minor gastric surgery. 
you know, he was okay, right? And he died in the operating room. That happens to people. They get hospital pneumonia, we call it. Also, they get an infection in the hospital. We know these things, okay? So there's so many unfixed lifespan. And then the second two of the second two reasonings are related. Second one is there's so many diseases, so many natural disasters, accidents, things that can happen to you that, that are more things that are aiming to your death than keeping you alive, unfortunately. Okay? And the third reasoning related to that is the body's very delicate. The body's very delicate. So sometimes you, it, it's, you know, in a car accident, it's just because the materials of the car and the velocity of the speed that you're going is stronger than this. So you get crushed in the car. That's why you die like that. And earthquakes, you know, I've been in, in some earthquakes. It's not the earthquakes that kills you. It's the building that falls down in your head that collapses like that. The landslide that, that happens is stronger than this. This is very delicate. Okay. So we've got those three reasonings that lead you to a resolu resolution. Not only am I going to practice, I have to do it now. I have to do it now. There's no more time to waste, right? Death is coming soon. And I don't know when, I don't know when, okay? Third reasoning, easier to understand, the only thing that benefits you at the death time is your spiritual practice. Spiritual practice, okay? So let's look at this. This is a little controversy sometimes. Number one, um, your possessions. I, I say your possessions and your position, okay? Your possessions are meaningless when you're dying. Now, people will say, but if I'm rich, if I have enough money, and I know many people that say this, I can be in the nursing facility that I want. I'm choosing to die at home and I can have the right care. Absolutely. But I've met people that have all the wonderful care and the comfortable bed and 24 hour nursing and, you know, somebody comes in to massage the feet and whatever they're doing, right? And they're miserable. The mind is not, not happy. So it's not going to take care of your mind. Okay. And then possessions, people clinging on when they're dying, the house, the jewelry, you know, this item of clothing, that's my precious, whatever. And, and that, and they say that even when you die, the, the initial phases of the in-between period, you're watching everybody just give away your possessions and you, you're, you know, and you're like, no. So the simpler we can kind of set things up now, you know, the more peaceful the mind's going to be, the more peaceful that process. I'll take questions in a little bit. Hang, hang on to that question like that. Hold that thought. Okay. So just thinking about, um, position and possessions can really get in the way. We're very attached and we're very attached to our identity. So if you can realize I'm moving through things, I've had a good life. It's great that I have advantages, I've had a blessed life. I have an education. I have this title. I have this position with those things, but I do meet people that 85 years old and they're still telling you about when they won that legal case and they were the best lawyer and the, and it, it's kind of like, you've been telling me that story for 40 years. You know, like how, you know, it's kind of like every day, how are you being kind to people? What are you doing for other beings? You know, where's the joy in your practice? And those things really sustain you. That goes with you when you're dying, the practice, okay? So that's number one. Number two, friends and family, do they help you when you're dying? Do they help you when you're dying? What do you think? Yeah, at a certain point you're helpless. Yep. And what happens with friends and family? Now, if they, and Rinpoche's done this, if they're your Dharma sisters and brothers, and they know your practices, or you set them up with your life wishes, and they know what to do, people will do prayer circles around people and do practices. That can be really helpful. But sometimes... As we know, friends and families are crying over you. They're fighting over your belongings loudly in the room while you're dying, right? They're begging you not to die. I can't live without you. I've heard this in some of the hospice work I've done. That's really torturous for the person dying. So you want to make sure your friends and family know what you want. 
You know, there may be people, and I've seen this happen, where they've been asked not to come because they're too emotional or they're too angry with the person or they create tension in the room and you want to keep it peaceful. But write down your wishes. I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, that's number two. Friends and family, make sure it's the right grouping of people that you're comfortable, people know your wishes, things like that. Number three, your body's of no help when you're dying. It's usually the reason you're dying. It just can't support anymore like that, either illness, old age, things like that. So this leads you to a resolution. Not only will I practice, not only will I practice now, number two, but I'm going to practice well because that's what's going to sustain me in the dying process. Now, what actually happens when you're dying, and then I'll take some questions, um, Tibetan system is the mind exists on a most subtle level, a subtle level, and a gross level, and the body exists on the same, okay? Most subtle, subtle, and gross, okay? So this is my gross body, okay? You can see it, you know, and it's based on wind energy, lung in Tibetan, wind energy. Hindu Ayurvedic system, they call it prana. We're familiar with that. Chinese system, qi, life force, energy, okay? Physical in nature, it has a kind of physical basis. The mind in its most subtle form has a very unique way, always attached. So the most subtle mind is attached to the most subtle wind, energy. They ride along lifetime through lifetime through lifetime. But it's the seeds, the karmic seeds in that most subtle mind that inform how that wind life force energy is going to develop, okay? Why some people are deformed. Um, why someone is an American versus an Indian. You know, why someone's intelligent, not intelligent. Why somebody's beautiful or not beautiful is all based on the seeds in the most subtle mind or consciousness. And that's what Tibetan Buddhism says, reincarnates from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime, the most subtle consciousness. So we want to make sure we're planting positive seeds in that most subtle con consciousness, like that. And then it is from the, the gross, so this is a gross wind. <sighs> you hear it, you see my chest rise, <sighs> okay? There's more subtle winds, okay, that the body's based on. The upward moving subtle winds, they're called them, allow me to speak. It allows me to chew food and swallow. It allows me to blink, turn my head, cry, everything from the upper body onwards. Downward voiding subtle winds allow me to eliminate waste from the body, have sexual orgasm, walk, sit down, things like that, go to the bathroom. And then the most subtle wind, again, is what allows the fertilization to take place initially that creates your body. Sperm and egg come together, that life force is there, body starts to produce. But again, that most subtle wind is mounted there, separate from the body, separate from the wind, but connected, informing how the body's going to form. Like that, riding along. Like that. So the most subtle mind is something we're not familiar with as well, but it's always there. A clear, light nature. The mind in its most purest aspect almost like what I'd call, uh, what um, Professor Robert Thurman calls brilliant transparency, clear, light nature of mind, okay? And then it, it goes into a more subtle form of fluctuations of the consciousness. Subtle, not most subtle, subtle. Fluctuations, movements of your mind that create karma. And they say in Tibetan Buddhism, finger snap, there's 56 fluctuations, 56 movements of your mind in that. That's pretty subtle. Okay, you might get a sense of that in a longer retreat. Normally in regular life, we miss it. But what we do catch is gross mind. There's a thought. There's a memory. There's an idea. That's gross mind. We can track that. Oh yeah, I'm thinking this. Now I'm worried about this. Now I'm looking at that. Like that. Everybody following? So we've got gross, subtle, most subtle, body, and mind. And at the death time, what happens is everything goes back into the more subtle, 
And we know as the body starts disengaging with the outer as it's dying, if it's a slow death, it just happens more quickly if it's a fast death, like an accident. Everything starts disengaging from this reality, more subtle, goes into the clear light nature of mind. But if we're not meditating a lot, we won't recognize that clear light nature. And then we just sift through like ordinary beings. We've done it many times before. Okay. And then there's a process where the most subtle consciousness leaves the body, leaves this form. The, the body actually changes. I've seen people from when it seemed like the consciousness was there to when the consciousness left. The whole luster of the body goes. There might be a sign of fluid from the nose or something that, like that indicating the consciousness leaves. And then the consciousness goes into an in-between state called a bardo, simply means transition or in-between, for up to 49 days. Catapulted based on those karmic imprints and the most subtle consciousness dictating where it will take, where it will take rebirth. And then Tibetan system, up to 49 days, you definitely will find some sort of rebirth like that. And then the process starts all over again. Questions? Is this helpful for people, people in understanding a little bit more? And I'm sorry, because it's so short. Yes, please. Uh, I need one second to my... yeah. I wanted to ask... Uh... You can also take questions online, so let us know. So I wanted to ask, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that in those 49 days that you said, which is the interim phase, uh, what happens? It's uh, like we, we don't talk of the soul because as per Hindu mythology, it's the soul. But maybe as per uh, the Buddhist uh, tradition, it is your consciousness. Uh, but what happens during those 49 days? The... Mm -hmm. The consciousness just travels or moves yes. around? Or? And sometimes it really depends on what you mean by soul, because soul could be quite equated with that. But if you're seeing something as everlasting, unchanging, that is still you, we don't have a belief system in that. Mm -hmm. Like when I die, when Amy dies, the end of this life, she's gone, gone forever. I won't appear in this form again mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Um, so what happens, what we believe happens in the bardo is it's usually segmented into seven day periods. Okay. The bardo being initially is a little bit more attached to the life it just led, that it just left. And it might be watching and trying to make contact with people, but people don't see them. And, and people have had experience of losing someone where you're having like a prayer circle or you're hanging out with some friends and somebody feels the presence of the person sometimes, but Basically, they're catapulted based on the karmic seeds into looking for the next rebirth. What will they okay. have a connection with? Okay. And they, they have a more subtle body. It's a body that can go through walls and can travel, things like that. But mm -hmm. for ordinary beings, it's uncontrolled as far as where we end up. There's different lights that appear. There's different images that appear. And they also say, if you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, which isn't the really best translation of that title, but there's very bright lights and things that might frighten us, but there's more subtle lights. We tend to go to the subtle lights, which create the samsara again, but the bright lights could be where we can actually do a little bit more practice, but we tend to not be drawn there because it's a little bit more frightening. So there's a whole description of this in the Tibetan Book of the... Uh, of the dead, like that, that you okay. read. Yeah, thank you. Please. Wait, we're just going to get the microphone. Thank you. Is and did somebody check online if there's questions or? Isn't it okay. disturbing and unsettling to think you could be reincarnated? Is the microphone working? I don't hear. Isn't it? Uh, Disturbing to think you could be reincarnated as a lower life form. That's why I'm always you can be reincarnated as a lower life form. So you could come back as an animal. I'm always kind to animals and snakes. You're kind. Kind. Animals yes. Snakes. It's nice to be kind to animals. We we yeah. we've been animals before. They said the other thing is there's lower rebirths than animals. There's a preta rebirth of hungry ghosts. 
that is created by intense desire and craving and grasping, like attachment. And then there, the worst rebirth is in hell. And there's many different hell realms. Um, we have a whole variety like that. <laughs> Um, and again, that's created by really intensive negative behavior, sadistic killing, things like that. So you can come back in different rebirths. We also have human rebirths, the optimum rebirth to get enlightened from, because we have a balance of suffering and a balance of leisure. The suffering motivates us to want to practice. The leisure gives us the space and time to practice. There's two upper realms of God realms, a jealous God realm and a hedonistic God realm that are not supposed to be as advantageous, they're, they're hedonistic, they're very pleasurable, but as a result, you don't want to practice Dharma because you're just experiencing pleasure and you use up a lot of positive energy. Thank you. Okay, uh, may I? Please. All right, uh, one, one interesting aspect about your previous experiences, you worked for quite some time in the hospice and uh, there's something called biologically alive, but actually you are dead. Let's say someone in coma, deep coma, let's say like Michael Schumacher, uh, who's been living for more than a decade on life support. And then you look at some people who are basically biologically dead and are spiritually alive. Now, when you talk about death, I want your perspective. Are the two interlinked or are the two separate and which is the real death? Thank you. So which is the real death when they're considered brain dead? As I'm asking your perspective, what yes. is when we talk about death, which is that death, which we are yep. defining right now, the biologically biological death, which yep. you see in the hospice when we so, traditionally do it, or is it the spiritual? Yeah, it's slightly different in the Tibetan tradition. So again, I don't know what happens to people in coma. My mother was in a coma for seven months, pretty unresponsive. I don't know what her internal experience was, but she was alive. You know, they considered her medically alive as well. And she was breathing, you know, she could. And then there's people, people also wonder with Alzheimer's and dementia, they're not participating in our reality, but they're alive, but they're deterior, their minds deteriorating. What is that experience? I don't know internally. So what I would say with the Tibetan system is um, we're talking about when you're declared clinically dead, Okay, really when the breathing stops, there is still an internal process going on for the person. If you're a long time meditator, you will start to recognize some internal visions that go along with a nice peaceful death and be able to do some higher level meditations during that process that help you get enlightened more quickly. That's what we're training for with meditation. Otherwise, with somebody, what I would say is, if these people are hooked up on life support, in a sense, they may still be alive. We might say externally, there's no brain activity, but how do we really know? Because some people wake up from these comas, right? That's what I've heard. So I'm never quite sure when they say they're brain dead. And I know with my mother, there was a scan where they could see very low level brain activity, but who knows what her internal experience was? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's what they say. But again, we don't really, I mean, a Buddha would know what's really going on. And Rinpoche came to see her three months before she died. She was unresponsive, but, you know, Rinpoche just said, um, you know, keep her alive as long as you can. And she lived three more months. And, but there was a slow deterioration every, every few weeks and you know where it's headed like that. So I couldn't say what the, what, when they say they're brain dead, I, I don't know, but we're talking about when they really stop the machines and then the breathing really stops, there's still some internal activity, we would say, going on, the mind, more subtle mind, Buddhism says. So the more you train and can meditate, you are maximizing that opportunity for yourself. You can, like that. What if I don't, don't want the reincarnation? Uh, it's an inevitable, you're going to have it. <laughs> I don't want to take the birth again. <laughs> No choice. According to Tibetan Buddhism, no choice. So even the Buddha reincarnated again? Yeah, supposedly. In some form, form or other. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Still doing I mean, this is according to Tibetan Buddhism. Buddha. So everybody has their own belief yeah. system. But basically, we would say there's no choice. You're going to reincarnate. We're all reincarnation. And the, the mind continues on. So it's really helpful if you do a course on the mind 
separate. There's, of course, mind and its potential. We understand the mind as a continuum, a stream. There's no beginning because every moment, and it's something you have to meditate and think about, reflect on, every moment is caused by a preceding moment doesn't just pop in. There's always something that, and look at your own mind, like, oh yeah, that thought came from that thought and that thought. There was something before, 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 before. So you go back to your conception. People say to me, well, that was the beginning. Okay. But if you traced all these other moments of consciousness had a moment before that caused it, what about the moment of mind of conception? Because Buddhism says that has a preceding moment and that indicates a past life. And there's no first moment in Tibetan Buddhism. No first moment to your mind. It goes back and back and back and back like that. And so you also get forward, 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 another chance, another chance. What we want to try to do is can you improve every lifetime just a little bit more, mm -hmm. evolve a little bit? Like, you know, it's like you say, I want to be a Buddha. Well, that might be way out there for you. But what if I can be a little kinder? What if I can be a little less negatively reactive to somebody? and change that habit, you know? Like I'm learning like, okay, we have this problem in the States and the States is divided right now. And people go blah, blah, blah about this candidate, blah, blah, blah. And people get really angry with each other. So what if somebody's spouting something to me about, and I'm not, I just go, okay, well, that's an interesting opinion, but my mind's not disturbed, you know? And I also value you and I see you as a human being who's kind, you know? It's a big space of, for your mind and you're not so disturbed. So it could be your boss irritates you. That's your practice. Your mother irritates you. That's your practice. This, that, that's where we have to work is every day you're in the street, a car cuts you off. Anybody have a problem with that? Right? That's your practice. Seriously. No, but that's where it's the everyday things. We get opportunities every moment. How can I approach this with kindness? And when you meditate on bodhicitta, this is this big expression, I want to get a, become a Buddha to benefit all living beings. If you do those meditations regularly, the kindness of others, right? How, you know, and they might not look kind, okay? But there's a whole process of because of beginningless mind, everybody's had a chance to be my mother in some form or other. Well, the mother is the dearest. Like, I know my mother was, she, she made mistakes. She wasn't perfect. She was amazing. Incredibly kind. Like if anybody just to have one life of the kindness of that being, right? So everybody, I have that relationship really with everybody. So if, you, if I can slowly through the meditation, start to soak my mind in that and kind of see you from that way. So when you irritate me, my mother irritated me sometimes, right? Mothers can be irritating, right? Okay. But when I still see you as dear as that being who always thought of me first, right? Then it expands, it makes the world more peaceful, right? That I'm not so negatively reactive. Yeah. That's our work. That's our job. Uh, how we spoke about uh, that kind of that, is that, that makes sense? Yes. So we, we, we just try step by step. Eastern religions, be it Buddhism or Hinduism, we perceive death very separately. We think in, we think of reincarnation and all that, but in a couple of Western countries, uh, euthanasia is uh, legally allowed. Yep. And uh, I recently read an article where a French writer, he was about 91 years old. Uh, he made movies and all that, and he was not on life support or he was very much conscious and he actively decided that it's my time to go. Mm -hmm. Right. Where in an Indian with an Indian mindset, we can probably never conceive of that thought because we believe that till the time the person takes his or her last breath, you know, we should do whatever possible we should do. So uh, is it a form of kindness? Uh, euthanasia? Yeah, euthanasia. So this is, um, there's some debatable things. Um, good question. The, um, in Buddhism, we don't tend to euthanize. Yeah. We, we like to have it naturally go. We don't even euthanize our pets. And that's a controversy. People go, well, my dog's suffering from cancer. How can you? But you can make your dog comfortable. I've done it with many animals. I've broken up sleeping pills. I've broken up painkillers. Kept them peaceful. Had mantras recited to them. Our, our belief systems, we try to do that as much as possible. The same with humans. 
Again, everyone's individual. So if you have a high teacher, a high Lama, perhaps come and see the person, they can advise, especially if they had a connection to the person. And I do know Rinpoche, there was one man, very old, had a heart attack. He was the father of, of some students of Rinpoche's. And he was dying, he had a massive heart attack, was dying in the hospital, was on life support. And Rinpoche um, advised the family, get the family together, get everybody by the bedside, and then you can disconnect the machines. Mm -hmm. And they did, and he lived 24 more hours, peaceful, passed away. Another man in his 40s got cancer. Rinpoche came to see him. And for some reason, Rinpoche advised, keep him alive as long as possible. So sometimes somebody highly realized with clairvoyance might see that this person still through the cancer process has something to work out and better that they'll be pure. When you're suffering, you're purifying. So better they purify in this life, let them go. If it's a dog or a cat, you know, your animal, they don't live that long with their illness. So if it's three weeks they, and you can keep the animal comfortable, but what people do is they go, it's inconvenient for me. The dog's you know, wetting the bed and I don't want to deal with it anymore. I'm, so I'm going to take it to the vet. And you have to, it's, an, it's a personal decision. I, I had a friend that did the euthanasia in Holland from very bad cancer. Mm -hmm. It's his personal decision. He's not a Buddhist and he decided to do that. And so normally we would try to let it naturally ride out as long as you can manage the pain and keep yourself as lucid as possible to do your practices. That's what we would recommend. It's similar also organ donation, people ask me. Mm. If you're a, a, gr a great meditator, you may opt not to donate organs, but it's a personal decision because with organ harvesting, they have to take the organs right away. Mm. So um, then you may not want to interrupt your meditation process, but some people have a, a great wish to give many people life from their body, then fair enough, then do that. Then. So another thing I'd recommend is make sure, please make sure your paperwork is together. Whether you have a will of your belongings, if you have a lot of belongings, whether you have a living will of how do you want your body to be managed, how do you want your pain to be managed, are you sure that you have, make sure you have a good person as your advocate, that they think similarly. You know, that they're not going to say, okay, she's dead, let's unplug, you know, we're done here. Like really, it's really helpful and you can, every few years it's good to update those things because it changes right now. Like I have my papers ready from five years ago, but Lama Zobram, she passed away. So he's at the top of my list, to, but he's gone. So now I have to update so they know who to contact and, and it's really helpful. And then your mind's quite peaceful. I actually recorded all my practice on, um, it's on memory stick, so people can just plug me in. They don't have, my family doesn't have to worry what they're doing. And wait, we have a question online. Okay. Let me just see if I can. Priya? Yeah. Um, okay, you're on. Yeah. yeah. So actually my father passed away a few days back only. So he was like, extremely healthy he was almost 80 but he I'm was so a doctor sorry. and um you know like he had uh, he had no comorbidities like diabetes or anything he just got sick uh he got fever and then it just escalated one after the other we tried every big hospital every nurses doctors but he, mm. he we couldn't save him so now uh not I'm like I have never faced death of a loved one before so it's been so difficult and the emotions that I've been facing is like whenever I'm seeing my friends with their parents I'm like I'm feeling jealous that for them it's there but for me why he's gone and also like does this grief ever go away or what's is like the best way to, you know to get over this grief and I'm also feeling like I want to hold him and I want to see him. I just cannot let go. And can I even, even function normally? Like I have lost all motivation in my life to work, to look after my child or anything. I do yoga, piano. Everything seems like what is life for? I, I don't like feel like doing anything at all. So 
I would like ask your suggestion. So even I'm scared to meditate because I don't want to sit with sit with that feeling because I don't know. I think I mean yeah. I'm crying for hours, but I cannot let it go. Yeah. So this is. I'm so sorry about your father. Um, this is very common in grief process, especially with a new death. Um, very very common, and grief does end. It's helpful to know it does end. Um, but it takes time and it's very different for each type of death. So, I mean, the death of a child from suicide is probably one of the worst things or something like that from an accident. Um, but everybody processes it di differently. So there's no rush. There's no, there's no kind of people saying, okay, well, it's been a year now. You should feel better. It's your own individual process for most deaths. So the grief process cycle, especially with an older parent, is roughly about two years. When So allow yourself, there's times you're going to break down and cry. There's times you're going to feel hopeless. Very normal part. You could also look at talking to a grief counselor. They're very specific in grief, not just a normal counselor. Sometimes people find that helpful. But just allow yourself, be, take your time with your family. It's a very normal process of looking at friends like, why did my father have to die and this person's alive? And it's a very common process. So just be kind to yourself, do good things for yourself and spend some time, family time, really being present with your child, I would say, to honor that. And you do the best you can and time heals. Time really heals. So you just have to give it time. And don't make any big decisions at this time. You know, I always tell people, like I know people that lose a life partner 25, 40 years. And it's like, you don't need to sell the house right away. You don't need to get rid of their clothes right away. Like give it a year till you really, because the mind's not very balanced in grief. So let yourself, and, and many, many different religions, spiritualities have different death rituals. And um, so I find them very helpful for people getting together, gathering with family, sharing meals together when you can doing memorial services, and doing things that the person liked. I know somebody, one of the processes, these are just different things people choose. Somebody for one year, um, part of their practice is they put out the person, it was their father, and they put out every day in their practice his favorite food. So whatever he liked, and they put it on their altar to honor, to kind of have breakfast with him, or have a piece of apple pie with him, or you know, so there's certain rituals people do that I find very helpful. Um, you know, I'm in the Jewish background, they have a seven day sitting, it's called sitting period. So people come to your house, bring food, so you don't have to cook, that you can just grieve and cry, and, but you're with friends, you're with family, and people tell, and you know, memorials are great, they tell stories, inspiring stories about the person, um, and so these different rituals I, I find are really helpful for people to gather and uh, to be sad with you, to cry with you, and to help you let go. And we have to realize, I think, more with our death understanding and practice, we start realizing that, you know, these things are going to happen. And, um, and how best, once you're past the grieving process, how best can I get myself ready for the process? Am I ready? like that. Does that, does that help a little bit, Priya? Okay. Uh, Venerable, I have uh, two points that I want to raise. Number one, uh, what according to you uh, is the state of deathlessness? And number two, I've often heard His Holiness say that he meditates on death and dying five times in a day. And yet he's not sure that when it actually happens, whether he'll be able to control his mind. So is there any hope for people like us if his holiness is you know, making that statement? Thank you. Sure, I mean, I would, I would say, and what, one of the things I heard his holiness say is that he does the death absorption meditations like six to eight times a day because they come in tantric practice. They come in my practices several times a day. So there's, in the retreat, we do longer these visualizations that actually happen internally. You can get these, these visions will happen anyway. They're happening now when you fall asleep every night, when you have a big yawn or a big sneeze, sexual orgasm. They're like mini deaths. 
these things, these visions happen, but because we haven't meditated on them enough, we don't recognize them, but they're going to happen at death time. If you can recognize them, you can maybe recognize the clear light of death and then do more emptiness meditation at that point. So one of the things I heard his holiness say was he does those meditations slowly every day. Um, deathless state is the state of Buddhahood where you're, you, you die, the body dies because it's more, this thing is finished, you know, it finishes, but you're not affected. There's no imbalance and you can control your rebirth and dictate exactly where you take rebirth because you have high levels of realization. Yeah. So I would say there's great hope for us and we have to start where we are. And Lama Zopa Rinpoche, a long time ago, somebody was asking, I don't have any bodhicitta, but I set a motivation every day. And Rinpoche said, you have to start somewhere. So we start at whatever baby level we are and you make little strides, little steps. And, and eventually, because we have Buddha nature, which is a seed of our goodness, eventually you get enlightened. You'll get enlightened. But it takes great effort. But so does life, right? We know how to do effort. We just don't always make it in the right ways like that. So I, I think we have a lot of hope. I might not be able to frame it well. I might not be able to frame the question well, but uh, what I'm trying to ask here is uh, the practice is throughout the life for the moment when the last breath is leaving the body. Uh, but based on your experience, what is the what is uh, the motivation or the attention or the practice leading to, and what would say you do in that exact last breath and how do you start preparing from it uh, from today or from this moment how do you start preparing towards that journey that okay moment so part of it i've been mentioning in here you know how you wake up in the morning motivation um i would encourage study like finding an authentic path like this and sticking with one path for a while understanding the basic philosophy meditating on that philosophy and establishing a healthy, uh, regular meditation practice, getting a little bit of time for retreat. So all these components are part of that. And then I would say at the death time, the more I can remember my guru and remember some of the death meditations and, you know, some of the more profound meditations, bodhicitta and emptiness, I would try to study that and try to maximize that at the death time if I can, because there's less attachment and, and more wish to benefit others. If you can't really do much, there's a very profound meditation called, um, that we'll do in the retreat at Tushita in Dharamsala, uh, Tong Lin meditation, some of you have heard of, giving and taking, where I'm focused on taking others' suffering, giving them my happiness, my joy. You know, if you're just focused on that when you're dying, it's kind of mounted on the breath. You can learn how to do that. Very profound place for your mind in the last moments. So whatever virtuous thought you can arise in the last moments, very, very helpful, I would say. Yes. Thank you, Vendival. Um so I have some family members at home who are really old age, they're in their mid 80s or late 80s. And we are obviously expecting them to sort of pass away at some point in time. They're fit and they're well and they're taking care of themselves both mentally and physically. But the question is, how can you, I mean, these people are going to pass away at some point in time and you will be there when that is happening. So what can you do as an individual to help these people who are in the process of dying or they're on their bed death? Sure. Yeah. Your parents you're speaking about? or No, my grandparents. Grandparents, okay. So when you said, the first thing we have to start to do is train our minds. When you said, so you're definitely going to be there when they're passing away, you don't know that. Okay? And here's something else we do. How many of you will say sometimes, oh, when I'm old, well, you don't know if you're going to live to be old. Okay? So I, I've, I changed my language to say, if I live to be old, then maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll be in the nursing home together, or maybe we'll... So, so little things like that, immediately, it's more meditation on the time of death is uncertain. 
over and over and over. So, but if somebody's dying, you're taking care of somebody. Um, first of all, understand what their wishes are now. Now, my mother didn't want to talk about death. For years, I asked her, mom, what do you want? You know, do you want every measure? Do you want us to leave you? Do you want, you know, she didn't want to talk about it. But then my grandmother died. And then I, and then I, at some point, a few days later, my grandmother was very old. Anyway, a few days later, my mom and I were sitting in the kitchen. And I said, you know, remember, I said, you know what made it easier for us when she died is we knew exactly what she wanted. And we did all, everything she wanted. So we were just devoid of any guilt or remorse. Or, and then as soon as my mother heard that, she started to tell me what she wanted. She got it. She understood that, like how much easier our minds were peaceful. So if there's some way to understand an appropriate conversation, not at the wrong time, but try to find out a little bit. Sometimes they might just mention, oh, I want my ashes scattered, you know, or I don't want to be cremated, or I want to be cremated, or I want to be cremated here. Just, you know, make little notes and, and say, you know, at some point, have you written anything down? Or is there a certain thing, place you want this to happen? Or, and you, you can find out, you know, maybe working with your parents and, and uh, see if you can find out a little bit gently what people want. And then just try to honor the wishes and try to keep them peaceful, um, the room peaceful. And you just try to be there when you can. If you need to actually nurse them and support them, you can see maybe you take turns with members of the family. So they can, that, that would, I would just say finding out what the person's wishes are and trying to honor the wishes as best as you can. Let's be reasonable with our own plans. You know, I don't have, like I'd, I'd probably be cremated, but I don't have a thing where I do have some things about my ashes, but I say, if possible, in, in my written, it's a legal document. It's gone through a lawyer like this. There were witnesses so that it's all legal. But I always say, if possible, I'm not asking someone to summit Mount Everest and drop my ashes there. I'm not asking for that. Like, you want to be reasonable. Like, I've had friends where they said, well, if they ship my body to, that's a hassle for people to have to ship your body. I mean, think, but really think about it like that. So try to make it reasonable. And um, if it's your own wishes and see, and there are some times with parents where they're asking for something that's really hard. So maybe just try to have a gentle conversation with, you know, that we don't have anybody to take care of you here. But if you want to move to my house, you know, I, I've had friends that had to have conversations with parents like that, um, depending on what. And I do know some people where the parent, um, just somebody I spoke to today, that the parent's very difficult and they insist on being in their own house. This is someone in their late 90s difficult personality and they decided they had the money to renovate the bottom of the house for a caregiver who will live in the house now to take care of them. Cause you know, so sometimes you say, we're not doing that. And sometimes you go, okay, we'll do it. And they're proceeding with that. So it's very individual. It's very individual and you do the best you can. And an understanding in death, there is chaos. Sometimes it's, chaotic. Me as a hospice volunteer, I've come into places and it's kind of a mess and there's somebody crying in the corner and there's somebody yelling at somebody and there's, and the person just messed the bed and, you know, and sometimes in death you end up, you're the only one in the room and it's very peaceful. Suddenly it's all quieted down. My mother's room, she was all tubed up in this coma with an infection. And, and sometimes during the day I'd be trying to do a medicine Buddha puja there. Um, I would recommend, um, FPMT has a red death book. It's, it's something about the title, how to enjoy death. And, but Rinpoche put this book together and all the practices in our tradition are there. So people always ask me, what do I do? You get that book. And the second part of it is all the practices you can just read in English. Um, even if you don't really know, you just do your best. You can read and my mother's room, the x-ray person came in, the doctors came in, this team of people was noisy. And then all of a sudden, they'd all leave. And then I just pick up the puja where I was. I just, you know, you just, you can adapt like that. And just knowing there's going to be those ups and downs. And sometimes you don't need to say, so we don't know what to say to people when they're dying. 
You know, the best thing is just be authentic. And sometimes you don't really need to say much, you know, like that. So we, we tend to get nervous and we start talking from, you know, saying things that aren't appropriate. You just um, sometimes can just sit there with them and like that. So I know we're out of time, but I hope this has been helpful. It's been lovely to have those of you in person. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet some of you. Thank you for joining online. I'm very grateful to um, see one person I know online. Thank you for joining and the rest of you. And thank you, Priya, for your question. Um, oh, is there more questions? Yes. If somebody wants to ask, please. Yeah, Joya. I'm so sorry about also somebody's mother passed away 10 days ago. I'm so sorry. And uh, yeah, Joya, please. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, uh, it's a very practical, yeah. If somebody dies and you're in a place where you don't have your dharma friends or family around, uh, they tend to burn you on the same day. They take you to the cremation ground, you're clinically dead. And they take you to the ground and burn you on the same day. So, being, I mean, having done my, some of my practices earlier, I knew when my husband died, I kept him for three days uh, in an ice kind of box. And the uh, trouble is, is, when we took him to the cremation ground in the ambulance, I mean, in a kind of ambulance, I felt his feet were all soft and like alive. And I suddenly got this feeling that maybe it's too early, you know. He's right there in his body. And, and my mother, when she died, it was in my sister's house. They, the brother-in-law is kind of Hindu. I mean, they follow Hindu practices. They took it the same afternoon. And I was resisting. I said, no, get the boss, keep her here. And as soon as she died at night, I recited the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I told her, these are the kind of things that come. These are all your old mind. I talked to her nonstop after she, but, but it, 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 by morning, they had decided they're going to take her to the grounds. So this is the kind of problem we have in India. If you're not in the right environment, I had the Tibetan friends who came for my husband and they, you know, they spent hours and hours with me. But in my mother's case, they weren't there. So it's a problem what to do because we know about the three and a half days sometimes, you know. Well, I think we, I think we have to do the best we can. So if you know that situation, you may want to, in writing, put, put the writing down, you know, put it down and give it to people that you trust to carry out those wishes is, what I would, is the best we can do. You can't really control that, but the consciousness still will leave at some point. It'll just, it, usually we leave the body for three days as Buddhist belief, and the consciousness has generally up to three days to leave the body other than great meditators who can prolong that process um, while they're meditating to gain higher realizations. But the average person, it's up to three days. And even if they take you away before that time, the consciousness still leaves the body. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to get you get your daughter there and she'll take care of it, right? Cuz I used to know I used to know her daughter, so I was just um Yeah, thank you. Anju. Anju. How is she doing? Yeah. She's doing very well. Good. Great. Very well. So on behalf of Tashita, I would really thank like to so thank uh, Venerable Amy Miller for uh, making us familiar with the death and the dying process and what we need to do, how we can become friends with our own death. Uh, and I'm sorry this was so short. It's really a short blast of, uh, so maybe you can come so, to the retreat. Yeah. Well, if uh, not for the retreat, on the 2nd on the second of uh, December, uh, Venerable will be passing through the center again. So maybe De in December the, 3, I, I fly back. December 3 from Tushita. No, but then 
on uh, 2nd December, won't you be here? No, no. December 3 so is the flight third, back. 3rd December evening. I, I may be back here. I'm not sure. Yeah, but I, I, do, I know I fly back to Delhi on December 3rd. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if possible, we'll try and have you here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then thank you. Uh, maybe Very we kind. can have another session. Well, I request you to take out some time. For thank us. you. Yeah. Absolutely. Contact Tushita Dharamsala. Tushita Dharamsala. Do you have? You can get that contact. Contact them, and there's. I believe. I don't know the registration, but contact them, and you can register. Yeah. Great. Be lovely to have you there. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank Harris. you so much. A thank you. Of appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank I you. want to thank all of you for coming and try as best as you can to put some practice into place. Do your best um, and try to enjoy and have a happy mind. And please pray for the United States on Tuesday. <laughs> please. Please. It's, um, yeah. Anyway. Thank you so much, and lovely to meet all of you, and I hope to see you again. Thank you so much. If you need info, um, I have a website these students created, amymiller.com. I forgot to bring the cards down, um, Amy, A-M-Y, Miller.com. You could contact me through that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you want to do some dedication? Oh, yes, and please, thank you. And whatever merit we have created, from this time together. May we invest it, all the beings who have passed away in the last 49 days, some of the people online, um, may they take a precious human rebirth to get enlightened quickly. I'd especially like to dedicate to some people I know, Philip Trimble, Ellen Fletcher, Keldon Sering, Bella, um, and John Ambrose Aitz. And um, may we, um, progress on our path to enlightenment as quickly as possible to really help all the beings on this planet as much as we can. Thank you so much. And for Rinpoche to return to us as quickly as possible in the most optimal rebirth. Thank you very, very much.